It turns out that besides being unfair to poor people and unfair to losers, the willingness and ability to pay and willingness to accept criteria, I mean, there's nothing wrong with willingness and ability to pay and willingness to accept, but using them as a decision-making cri criterion, as as the Calder-Hicks, which is the same as cost-benefit analysis, which is the same as the potential Pareto approaches do, has is unfair to users and it disadvantages the poor. Those are normative problems. They have to do with with um, ethical questions. There also turns out to be positive problems. That is ways in which even regard regardless of any kind of outside of any kind of ethical considerations, just completely objective uh, considerations, their problems. And these arise because y you can ask, as 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 we do here, what what is your opinion about moving to A? But you can also ask, what is your opinion about not moving to A? Now you think that your opinion about not moving to, to A would be exactly the opposite of your opinion about moving to A. But actually, that's not the case. So, if you ask individual one, what is your... So, so when individual one was somebody who would benefit if you moved to A. Now you ask, what, now the government's thinking about not moving to A. Well, then you ask, what, what is individuals one, one individuals one willingness to accept compensation for not moving to A? So it's not a willingness to pay anymore because he doesn't want to not move to A. It's willingness to accept. And in general, that's not going to be $10. That's going to be a different number, let's say 6. Ask individual 2 what is who also would benefit moving to A. What is their willingness to accept compensation if the government decides not to move to A? It's not going to be $8. It's going to be something different, let's say 4. Similarly, l look at look at individual three. Before we asked what was their willingness to tolerate a move to A, and it was six dollars, the willingness to accept. But now that if the government's contemplating not moving to A, they're going to be willing to pay to get the government not to move to A because they don't want to move to A. But that's that number. It turns out it's not going to be six. It's going to be something different. Say it's seven. And individual four, who before didn't he doesn't want to move to A. Before he had a a willingness to accept a five dollars to tolerate a move to A, but now the government's thinking about not moving to A and asking how much is he willing to pay. That's going to be a, a different number. Let's say it's six. The winners of moving to A, who are individual one and two have a joint willingness to accept of $10 willingness to accept compensation if the government decides not to move to A. The losers of moving to A, those are individuals 3 and 4, oops, have a joint willingness and ability to pay to not move to A of 6 plus 7, which is 13, not 11. This is supposed to be 13. Sorry about that. So, what should society do? Well, society compares $10 to 13. 13 is bigger, so this group prevails. This is the group which had a willingness to pay not to move to A. In other words, these are individuals 3 and 4, so individuals 3 and 4 win. So what society ends up concluding about not move to A is society should not move to A. Because not moving to A, the willingness to pay was 13, and the willingness to accept uh, was only 10. Yeah, but up here, we concluded that society should move to A.
So because the numbers of willingness to accept and willingness to pay are different in this case and in this case, because the policies are different, the first case is moving to A and the second case is not moving to A, we get different conclusions. In the first case, we said society should move to A, and in the second case, we said society should not move to A. Now, you don't always have this kind of contradiction when you use this approach. But you can have this contradiction. Economists have studied much more systematically than, than I have described how the number how the numbers for the first approach tend to differ for the numbers from the second approach, tend to switch. All I want to point out here is that they do switch, that willingness to accept is in general, for one person, is in general not, not the same as willingness to pay um, for a policy or for not doing the policy. And so you can run into, you can run into contradictions. Another a problem that occurs, and I'm not going to get into it, is the study. So here we studied moving to A and not moving to A. There's another thing you could study, which is which is w having moved to, from the original point to A, should you move back? In other words, it's the reverse m movement. Now, it's certainly would make sense that if you've used these concepts and the social decision rule has said you should move to A, then you would hope in the new situation using the same concepts, the social decision rule wouldn't say now you should go back to where you were before. Unfortunately, because of the changes of the numbers between here and here, that's not guaranteed. You can have situations where this social decision rule says you should move from the original point to point A, and it also says once you're at point A, you should move back to the original point. That's nuts, right? I mean, that, that would just be a policy going in, in circles. Now, all this was discovered as early as, I think, 1943. So, in other words, you got not only the unfairness problems that we talked about in the previous video, but you also have these positive problems. Now, again, these positive problems don't always occur. Sometimes the potential parade approach is completely consistent with itself, but other times it's not. So it really raises the question, why is this such a popular approach? And I'm going to reject it. Um, the book doesn't really reject it, but I'm going to. Uh, what I'm going to say is that I think willingness to pay and willingness to accept, granted the numbers are different here than they are here, so look at all the numbers, um, are useful in order to try to construct an actual Pareto improvement. But because these numbers change from scenario to scenario, the only way to make sure you've got a Pareto improvement is to ask people. But if everybody says, yeah, we would, we would like to adopt this kind of joint policy, adopt a policy, tax the winners, compensate the losers, if everybody's better off that way, then go for it. But in teaching the rest of this class, I'm not going to use the potential Pareto approach. I'm not going to say, well, if the winners could compensate the losers and still be better off, then society should do it even if the winners aren't going to compensate the losers. So I'm just not going to, to take that position. Now there's one other complication, uh, and this will... Uh, the, 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 the the book addresses this just a minute let me see it's this is um it's on, it's on page it's on, it's on page 95 it's called box 7.1 willingness to pay and whoops i don't know i wow, i got one note help here don't really want that and the book suggests that you can read willingness to pay off of a demand curve 
So a demand curve, you have price, you have quantity, here's the demand curve. And how much are people willing to pay for 10 units of this quantity? Well, you know that if the price here is, is $3, then they'd be willing to buy 10, so doesn't that show willingness to pay? Well, yes and no. Um, the problem with using a demand curve is for a quantity like 10, it just gives you a number 3. Whereas we actually know that there's a difference between your willingness to pay to move to A and your willingness to accept to not move to A. So your willingness to go, let's say, from 9 to 10 is going to have a different number than your willingness to accept not moving from 9 to 10. So the the tenth, you know, how much is a tenth unit worth? It gives you a different answer depending on whether you have the tenth unit or whether you're not going to get the tenth unit. And the demand curve approach doesn't show that. Another thing that the book says is if you're if you're interested in total willingness to pay to get the 10 units, you have to think about what the consumer was willing to pay to get to the first unit and what the consumer was willing to pay to get to the second unit and what the consumer was willing to pay to get to the third unit and so forth, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And you need to add all those up. And so the book ends up with... Uh, an area like this, an area under the demand curve, which the book interprets as a total willingness to pay. And by the way, it's not just this book. Most textbooks, almost all undergraduate textbooks do this. So they interpret the whole area under the demand curve as being willingness to pay. Although again, uh, it doesn't show this ambiguity between the number for willingness to pay and the number for willingness to accept. Then the book continues to say, if the price in the marketplace is three dollars then the consumers actually have to pay just three dollars so the blue rectangle has a height of three dollars and a width of ten so that's the amount of money that the consumers have to pay but they'd be willing to pay the whole area under the demand curve shown shown by the the these these black hatch lines they'd be willing to pay all this but they only have to pay the blue rectangle and so there's some bonus They'd be willing to pay the whole, this whole area, but they only have to pay the blue rectangle. And so this area represents some kind of bonus to consumers that they get because they only have to play the blue rectangle and they'd be willing to pay more. And this area is called consumer surplus. There are problems with consumer surplus. So again, the subtlety of the distinction between willingness to pay and willingness to accept is not reflected in consumer surplus. Here's another problem. Take the Pareto approach. So you move to A. Suppose A is 10 units of Q. You tax the winners $12, and you give, the, you give it to the losers. That is going to change the income of the winners and the losers. And changing income is actually going to change the position of the demand curve. Because one of the most important things that determines where demand curves are is the income of the people who are doing the demanding. And so if their income changes, the location of the demand curve is going to change. So an additional problem with consumer surplus and this whole demand curve approach is that if you if you actually do the compensation, you tax the winners and give the money to the losers, the demand curve in general shifts. Now, um, of course, what the winners get lose is what the losers win, the, the $12. So, if, if everybody has exactly the same preferences, then the demand curve is going to stay the same because you just, um, well, even that's actually not true in general.
sorry. So in general, the demand curve is going to shift because you've had a shift in incomes. And I mean, it might get bigger, it might get smaller, depending on which way the income has shifted and how these people think about Q. But the point is that the, the market demand curve is the sum of the demand curve of all the different individuals in the economy. Now you've shifted their income, you've shuffled income from one group to another group, so that's going to that's gonna change the position of the demand curve, which then is going to change the amount of consumer surplus. Because, uh, of course, if the demand curve shifts either up or down, let's, let's say it shifts like this, the new demand curve D prime. Well, then you have a different amount of consumer surplus. So uh, this whole Caldor-Hicks cost-benefit analysis potential Pareto approach has a lot of problems. And like I said, I'm not going to use it. I'm just going to stick with um, stick with Pareto, and I'm going to use. Mm, WATP and WTA just to try to construct Pareto improvements. But I should emphasize how important in in economics the the Caldor-Hicks cost-benefit analysis potential Pareto approach is. It's almost universally used and for, um, in environmental the Environmental Protection Agency uses cost-benefit analysis because that was ordered by President Reagan, and all future presidents have retained that. Um, Caldor Hicks is used in law and economics all the time. Uh, the potential Pareto approach is just another name for these two. So these are really widely used approaches. So I'm not, I'm not really criticizing your book for introducing these approaches. They really, they really needed to. And the fact that they're not criticizing the approaches means that they're taking the position that the vast majority of economists take, but not not me. And um, I have, I think, mentioned in other videos that um, I've been pretty busy uh, these days in, uh, in early 2021. The reason is because I'm finishing up a very long paper with one of my colleagues, Professor Mark Glick, who's not only an economics professor, but he's also an attorney. And... Um, has dealt a lot with cost-benefit analysis and Caldor Hicks. So we're finishing this long paper in which we're analyzing this topic in a lot more detail and trying to defend our, our point, points of view. Okay, I think that's enough for this video.